Welcome to the Everyone's a Critic Movie Review Podcast. I'm your co-host, Bob Zarrell. With me, as always, is professional film critic, Sean Patrick. And joining us this week is Amy Kay. I mean, how do you want your name to be announced? That's fine. Yeah. I mean, I'm Sean's sister. You can always just call me Sean's sister. That's fine, too. <laughs> Why do you always tell people that? Because <laughs> you love it. Because <laughs> you love it. <laughs> Visit us at IHateCritics.net, Everyone's a Critic Podcast.com. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Our handle is Critics Pod. You can listen to us at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Alexa, all your podcatchers. Uh, we're on YouTube. We're live right now, either Sunday mornings or Monday nights. Uh, so if you want to follow us there, click the little bell in the, was it in the right hand corner, upper right hand corner. Who knows? Notified when we're live. <laughs> Just find the bell. Just go to YouTube and find yeah. the bell. You've been on YouTube before. You've done this. It's fine. <laughs> I've never actually clicked the bell for anybody. Is that a problem? <laughs> <laughs> and then Patreon. Patreon.com slash Critics Pods. The best way to help support the podcast. We do a live ep- or a bonus episode every month. Uh, we had the I Spin Your Grave, which has come out. Uh, Amy joined us for that one. Uh, we also currently have out there the A24 the top 24 of a 24 featuring Josh, our old co-host. Uh, and we're, we have an idea for the April one, although I can't find it. So we'll have to figure that one out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but either way, we'll do something. Uh, we're going to try to do it monthly, but let's go ahead and get started this week. Uh, let me find my pictures. The people watching at home. Don't go to the wrong thing. Okay, good. <laughs> Last I went straight to the to my Google or Safari browser. Uh, this is a movie. <clears throat> we'll start with the last champion. We're not, we're going to be brief because only I watched it. Uh, it was our fishing with Gandhi, the movie we talked about but never saw. Uh, our Patreon supporter Jason Bryant is actually in the movie. <clears throat> He's a Hall of Fame wrestling broadcaster. And uh, he is, you know how at the end of like a Karate Kid movie or a Rocky movie, there's that big score at the end that kind of goes with the fight. Instead of that, it's him and two other guys broadcasting the big fight. It's kind of unique. Uh, And it actually works. Uh, But but this is a, you know, it's a faith-based movie about a, you know, down on his luck, a high school hero who comes back to town after you know, leaving the town with kind of a stigma behind him and he's not welcome back in the town right away. And eventually the wrestling coach dies and they need a new wrestling coach. Similar to like, you know, the way back with Ben Affleck only with wrestling instead of uh, basketball. You know, at first he's being bright, you know, he's being blackmailed by one of the parents on the wrestling team. And then finally he kind of starts to do what's right. And, you know, it's, you've seen it before and all these right. movies, but it's, it's surprisingly a solid movie. You know, you get, you get invested in it <clears throat> and I, you know, you got to take it with a grain of salt because I am friends with one of the guys in the movie. <clears throat> Excuse me. But, uh, it, it actually does hold your interest and it's fairly competent. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, what's going to happen halfway through it. You know how the match is going to end just like in every other movie like this, where, you have the foreshadowing match beforehand and then the ending match opposite of what happened in the first match happens, but yeah. they, they do a great job of, you know, keeping you entertained and on the edge, uh, maybe not edge of your seat, but it's, they just do a good job with the movie. It's very competent. The faith based stuff is, I'd say it's more of a wrestling movie than a faith faith based movie. So that isn't in your face either. Uh, I don't know. I, I thought it was really good. And I, I just thought the ending was really neat with the, actual broadcast versus having some cool score it was yeah. a different a different way of going about it so uh in the show notes jason bryan has his own podcast matt talk a uh, wrestling podcast and he also does several other wrestling podcasts with all these colleges across the country uh but he had a lot of the people from this movie on his podcast so i'll have a lot of those notes in our show notes as well but i just wanted to mention that i saw it and it's worth Seeing if you're into <clears throat> just your straight ahead fun feel good sports movies, this one does work. All right, all right, good to hear. 
<laughs> Let's start with Safer at Home. Yes, Safer at Home is uh, from director Will Wernick, uh, who wrote and directed this, this, and he's the same guy who did Escape Room, which is uh, one of my favorite horror movies of uh, 2019. Uh, this one is a Zoom-based horror movie, uh, which is uh, the idea here is that a group of friends are getting together for their, their buddy Evan's birthday. They're doing it over uh, Zoom. And uh, this is because the pandemic in this universe has lasted into 2023 and gotten a lot worse. So it's even even deadlier and scarier and everybody's more locked into their homes than they ever were before. So there's one of them in Austin, one of two, one couple in New York. There's two couples in Los Angeles, uh, all on this one Zoom call. And from there, they, they're they trying to celebrate as best they can. So one of them gives them uh, – he sent them all a gift uh, – that uh, was in, in commemoration of their planned trip to Las Vegas, which includes a hit of Molly. And they each take that, and then things progress from there. As you, if you're, you know, you, the poster's got a woman covered in blood in it, and the movie isn't necessarily about being covered in blood. It's much smarter than that. This is not a traditional horror film per se. This is a drama that happens to have one singular moment in it that turns everything into a, a, a uh, not a mystery, but certainly something, something else. It makes it everything more dramatic and heightened. And uh, I, I thought this movie really did this very well. I thought the, the, the score especially really does a great job of building up the pace and the excitement. And they really ratchet things up towards an ending that uh, is shocking and, uh, and unique. And uh, you know, for, for what it's worth, I mean, of these movies, when we see these movies so often, these types of horror films, uh, we, I see so many of the same things. I liked the way this one did it, and I liked these characters, and I liked that it, that it's not uh, one of those movies where you're watching the background for something to move. This is a very this is all human drama as opposed to uh, you know, supernatural stuff. There's nothing supernatural in this movie at all. It's all human drama, and I I, I like that about this. I agree. <clears throat> it's so fast paced too that you don't have a chance to pick it apart. You know, so any any flaws that it would have you're so invested in what's going on that you you just miss them and because of that it 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 really does work at no point are you sitting there saying i wouldn't do that or i mean or maybe you maybe you're wondering you know if, if i was in the situation here's what i would do but it, it's moving so fast that you don't have time to get hung up on that and it doesn't ruin the movie for you uh i, I thought it was really well done and very very watchable and i I liked how they paced it because it allowed you to not get caught up in anything that could be wrong with it to the point where i couldn't tell you what's wrong with it because it was (laughs) that uh well done yeah it's really impressive and he's a good director he did the same thing with escape room he he took a unique premise and uh played it out to its uh you know logical conclusion uh concluded a good deal of uh, of smart scares, and uh, this is equally as, uh, if not even more, economical than that movie. What would you have done though if it was you? <laughs> I would have given up right away. <laughs> I think that, yeah, especially knowing what happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <clears throat> but yeah, I, there's not a whole lot to say other than it's good. And you should. Amy, you have any uh, questions about this movie? I know you didn't see it. Uh, it only got three point five stars out of ten on IMDb. That's bizarre to me. I really yeah. think that's tr- I really think that's strange. I don't know what movie they're watching. If they are, is, this, are, is this is like an unknown cast then? Or yeah, oh, there's yeah. nobody nobody well known in this movie. You, I could name these names and no one would probably recognize them. I I know I didn't, but then I you know I watch a lot of YouTubers, so you know it could be anybody in any movie at this point. <laughs> and I mean, but I mean, it, you know, and I usually. I almost always trust your reviews on things. Um, again, just even looking at this graphic kind of freaks me out. It looks like Natalie Portman or Lana Del Rey with, <laughs> with chocolate on their face. I, I don't know. I don't have any questions. <laughs> All right. I, I hate horror films, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, and even though. Like I said, it's not <laughs> traditionally a horror film in, in many ways. Uh, there's, right. There's one, there's one thing in the entire movie, really. And you don't find your you – know, with most, like, found footage, like, movies, you're always wondering, well, drop the camera or why are you still on Zoom or whatever it is. You don't have time to wonder in this movie, which I, I like, but it is weird that it has such bad reviews. I wonder how many reviews there are. <laughs> well, I can, I, can I just bring up one of the things that I saw on here? All right. That I thought was kind of um, 
fascinating. Now, of course, uh, here. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> wow. And again, this just came out this year. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's probably well, the main year, thing was from Variety, and it just said, friends, just don't let your friends take Molly on Zoom, basically. And then <laughs> apparently it just gets uglier at that. But there was one that I found. And now I can't find it. But if I find it, I'll bring it back up. But she, but this this woman basically said, you know, I, I could have just taken Molly and got on Zoom myself and done this, you know, so. OK, but that's, that's not, not sure. the movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that'd be a different experience. <laughs> it would be an entirely different experience. I've never taken Molly, but come on. Try reviewing the movie. I mean, maybe try watching the movie. I don't know. Uh, I know there's a lot of, uh, there's a large bias among many people, whether they're critics or just audience members against Zoom movies or movies about quarantine, because, you know, the last thing anybody wants to think about is quarantine uh, when you're in it. And uh, this movie is, uh, you know, using quarantine as a, an important part. It's the entire setting of this film. Yeah. And- I, you know, the, the thing over, they actually, and I can't remember the company that did it, but I watched a couple over in the UK. They made some pretty um, provocative Zoom movies, like it, it, short films, just short films. Um, one had Maxine Peake in it, and and it was just her and this guy, and they were basically saying, you know, she's not coming back to him. She went home to another uh, friend because he'd been abusing her. And it was it was a fantastic. It was so good. Again, like 15, 20 minutes long. But if you do it right, it, it can be compelling. So I, I do actually, I want to watch this because I'm I'm very, very curious to see how this plays out. I mean, it's definitely In terms not of, uh, and quarantine movies. I mean, locked locked down with uh, with uh, Anne Hathaway and uh, uh, is a good movie, but nobody watched it because again, nobody wants to watch quarantine. <laughs> they hear the they hear quarantine and it's like forget it. I don't want to see it. You know, the- maybe maybe twenty years from now. I don't even know if ten years is enough yeah. time after this. The worst part was Trump was still the president in twenty twenty three. God damn it! Did they bring that up in the movie? He's in it as a president. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to watch this movie. I mean, it's just a little bit, but. Right. You know. It's too but, long. <laughs> but it is available to rent on Amazon and Apple TV and all your other. I, I highly recommend it. I'll watch it. Crisis. Oh, I love everybody in this with. Well, except for Army Hammer. <laughs> I love this. I love Gary Oldman. I love that the wasp is in this. She probably wasn't the wasp in this. No, no, okay. definitely not. Uh, this is a crisis. Is a film by Nicholas Jarecki, who has uh, done some things in documentary and also you know a couple of different uh, films here and there. Uh, it's uh, about the the chain, the links in the chain of the opioid crisis, whether it's the uh, the corporate higher end or the the uh, the street level stuff where you've got uh, Evangeline Lilly has a son who dies in the midst of the opioid war you've got army hammer as a cop who's trying to t- who's trying to take down a big pill machine and then you've got Gary Oldman who's a professor who runs a uh, uh, a study essentially on one of these big clients of his one of these big uh, pharmaceutical clients who want him to just rubber stamp their pill so they can get it on the market because they claim that it's not addictive, but it is. And they want him to pretend that it's not. And he has to, the ethical battle over whether or not to do it. These plots don't really come together, but they're all representative of different aspects of the opioid crisis. And in that way, it's like a series of short films about the opioid crisis, which is kind of interesting. Uh, The Army Hammer one's pretty typical cop stuff. Uh, the Evangeline Lily one is, a, is an emotional plot uh, that that it feels kind of stunted a little bit. Gary Oldman, though, is is incredible in this movie and really kind of nails the 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 aspect of this that is the really interesting part, the ethical crisis, uh, the mustache twirling villains in this movie, the, the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, they're a little bit over the top, a little bit, uh, but. Uh, not so much that I was upset about it because they do kind of come off with villains. When you read stories on Twitter about how you know, people can't, uh, people lose their insurance and they can't afford, you know, uh, diabetes medication, and they have to, and they're they're basically reusing needles so they so they can just try to keep the cost down. I mean, 
uh, you, it just you know, these are villains, <laughs> regardless of your that feeling about like- <laughs> your, your villains. And uh, these people who are trying to put out this this particular drug uh, claim it's not uh, addictive, but uh, their claim is that it's not addictive after seven days. Uh, but if you go 10 days, suddenly it's super addictive <laughs> and people die. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> which Gary Oldman's people discovered just kind of by accident, which is uh, fun. Uh, I like this movie. I think it's a good movie. In fact, I think of the two movies that I saw that are involving the opioid crisis uh, this week, it's actually the better one, which uh, we're going to talk about the next, the, the other one on another show when it's actually available for people to watch outside of theaters. Uh, this is actually a better movie about the opioid crisis than that movie is. And this is only in theaters right now? I believe so, yes. All right. Anything else on crisis before we move on? Nothing really. Just like I said, it's it's better than it looks from the from the photo. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look very good in that photo. Tiger, tiger. Uh, this is a again kind of. I'm not sure whether this one qualifies as an opioid movie. It's a heroin movie, but it's also a drug movie in a different way. Tiger, tiger is an art piece more than it is anything else. Uh, The director of this movie was trying to tell the story of his own addiction, but do so in a very abstract way. So he has sort of a plot where this woman played by Sam, excuse me, Sam Corton uh, works for this uh, clinic where she is paid to essentially obtain pills by any means necessary, take them to this clinic, and then they get smuggled to this place called The Slabs, which is a real place in California uh, that is off the grid. Uh, People live there uh, in the middle of the desert on what the slabs of what were supposed to be homes that never got built, and they've built a community there uh, that uh, it's become a haven for, you know, criminals and such and drug users, but also just a place where people who don't want to be found by regular society can go and hide out. Uh, And they need medication just like everybody else so her job is to smuggle it there uh she ends up uh, robbing this place while uh dylan sprouse's character is there getting his methadone because he's trying to get off of heroin allegedly uh he kind of likes heroin so he's not sure how much he wants to be off of heroin and that's uh that's his journey throughout the movie is uh he'll have opportunities to have heroin or not have heroin uh and he's also uh, believed to be rich. They believe he's rich, so a couple of people kind of target him for perhaps kidnapping and such. As the story goes on, they enter the slabs and they go into this very strange community, and it turns into a part documentary at that point because they actually use the people who live on the slabs or slab city, as they call it as well. Uh, they use them, and they have these almost documentary sequences where the actors are being led through the scene by people who are showing off what they do in Slab City, whether it's uh, raising chickens to to sell eggs or trade eggs to other people or and so on, or you know making art and whatnot. And some of it's really lovely, but for the most part, this is just a, a meandering, go-nowhere kind of movie. Uh, I, I don't mind the, the art piece kind of stuff, but really, realistically, there's just no... <laughs> There's just no life to it in the end. And I, I think Sam Corton's really great. Dylan Sprouse isn't a bad actor. And I'm not going to sit here and crap on the guy because he was on Nickelodeon or whatever he was on, Disney <laughs> Channel, whatever it was. Uh, I know he was, he, was, he was one of the babies on Full House. I don't care. I, no, I'm not Big gonna, I'm, Daddy! <laughs> I'm not going to make fun of him for that. But the he, he, he is the only actor in the movie, and and he stands out because he looks like the only one who's really kind of searching for an actual narrative to play off. He's looking for something to play against, while everybody else is more of a non-actor. Uh, Sam Corden's an actress, but uh, the, everybody else in the movie is kind of a non-actor, and he's trying to act against them, and, and it's very obvious. And that's the uh, I think that's a, him. And he was at a disadvantage in many ways in that way. Yeah, it's pretty pretentious. Uh, <laughs> And I mean, not that they're the same movie, but having just seen Nomadland uh, also takes away from this. And I mean, I'm going to get to the same thing later on in the show where two movies, one, I don't know, the, we'll get to them later on, but just because you've seen something else that affects your opinion of another movie. Yeah. Uh, and that did the same. I just had a hard time caring because one, Nomadland is so good. And two, this is an art piece, so you just have to be in the mood for art piece pieces. And I wasn't, so. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm Any, with you. Anything else on Tiger Tiger? Not really. Great poster. Love the movie art. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> the Vigil. The Vigil. Uh, this is a this is a fun movie. I like this movie. Uh, this movie stars a guy named Dave Davis who plays uh, Yaakov. He's a uh, former Jewish Orthodox uh, man who has moved on from his religion due to a very serious trauma. He's uh, trying to move on anyway, but his community kind of is also trying to drew, draw him back in. He's got this uh, friend of his, Menashe, who's trying to bring him back around and bring him back into the Orthodox. Uh, which he kind of does when he when he uh, offers to pay Yaakov to come and sit the vigil for this man who's just passed away, which is a thing in the Jewish community, in the Orthodox community especially, where you need somebody needs to sit with the body for 24 hours before it can be taken away from bur- and prepared for burial. Uh, somebody else was doing it. They ran off and disappeared, <laughs> and they've asked, and he's asked Yaakov to step in and stay the night at this house sitting the vigil. And the rest of the movie is kind of you watching for that body to move, you know. And there's a couple of really great scenes in this movie where the director, uh, Keith Thomas, does a great job of framing Yakov with the body in the background. And you're just going, where is it? It's Watch, watch his hand. <laughs> like you're just watching the screen all over the place trying to see where it's going to move. And maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Uh, but it, it uses Judaism as a way to reinvent this type of storytelling. And, you know, because we've seen this with a million different movies of, you know, the Christian faith. So using Judaism as a way to do that and and the way that they use it and the way that they use his trauma of having lost a child uh, and to feed into that and to feed into this legend of this character that they have, this villain character that they have, I thought was really clever. Again, it's, it's everything you've seen before uh, in one of these movies, but I think it's better just because Dave Davis is a much more interesting actor. And really, they just take the things that you expect this type of movie to do, and they just do them better. And I, I can appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, I agree completely. They everything that they like the what they add to this is any problem you have with other horror movies, they kind of they deal with it with using the the different faith, and then his his past problems are they do a good job with that, help making it making you question things less if that for lack of a better phrase mm-hmm. uh yeah i thought it was really smart for taking something very typical and then making it fresh again it was pretty pretty impressive yeah that's what i love about it and really when you're gonna make a movie like this and they're gonna continue to make movies like this uh <laughs> just do it as best as you possibly can and and look at other movies and see where their problem areas are and improve upon them and i think this movie did that is this I was just time? reading a review from The Decider, and they were saying that it skulls somewhere between The Exorcist and The Babadook. Yeah. So yeah. would you agree with that? Absolutely. Kind of. I mean, I, I think it's better than The, better than the Exorcist. But. Yeah, no, no it's, it's not better than The Exorcist, but it definitely well, – The Babadook does – That I I can't do that. I watched that movie with my niece, and that, that movie was – I would prefer the exorcist. If I have to the movie, <laughs> I would prefer the exorcist. I think because the Bobby is too that, scary. Oh my God. I just can't, I can't do it when it's too, there was too something good. about kind of divorcing yourself from the exorcist of the time, you know, it's yeah. like, well, that happened way before me. And then you're making a movie with all these beautiful, I mean, it, it looked gorgeous, but it was, it, it was too much. This is definitely closer to the Babadook in okay. terms of horror. Uh, but another movie that does something really smart to make it not a typical idea, fresh. Mm-hmm. You know, strangely enough, I think a movie that it kind of reminded me of in a weird way is The Last Exorcism, which is yeah. a movie that is uh, about you know exorcism in movies, and it takes that concept and does it better than other movies about exorcism. And I appreciate that. And I think this movie takes something that you recognize uh, a demon movie and and just does it better. And I, I appreciate that. Lee Daniels on the United States versus Billy Holiday. Yes, uh, this is an incredible movie about the life of the legendary singer Billy Holiday. 
uh, starring a woman by the name of Andra Day, who is, uh, I'm not sure what she's done before this, but uh, she's incredible. And the, the performance here is the center of this movie. And for her to hold that center so extraordinarily well is, is really something. Lee Daniels is a hell of a director. I haven't loved everything he's done, but uh, I loved this. Uh, this is just when you when you try and nobody's ever really given Billie Holiday the proper look. They've never really given her the the real historical treatment that she deserves. And I think this movie does that. Uh, it's incredibly fair to her. It's a fair uh, understanding of her and her problems, but it's also placing her in the context of history, where it takes the song "Strange Fruit" and forces you to recognize just how incredibly bold and brave it was to sing that song at that time. Uh, to the point where the federal government was trying to stop her from singing it because it was radicalizing people when they heard it. Uh, and it's true, it was. It's a, it's a radical song. It was one of the first truly radical songs in history. And I had, I'd really not given it much mind, honestly. Uh, and then uh, finally, for the first time watching this movie, I'm actually listening to it and you're hearing what she's actually saying. It's like, my God, she said that to audiences at that time that is uh that's bold and that's something that you know she was the first to do it nobody else was doing it i mean you had a lot of people out there and i'm not trying to call out like uh the the late little richard but he was trying to placate audiences with a good time and as much as billy holiday was capable of that she was also going to sing strange fruit and make you desperately uncomfortable <laughs> On the same token, you know, she's also very troubled. You know, she had a, a serious drug problem. And this movie details, you know, in, a, in a way that's very similar to, say, uh, Judas and the Black Messiah, about uh, the ways in which the FBI or the DEA, in this case, the, the virgin form of the DEA, uh, the, the way that the federal government tried to stop yet another Black Messiah. You hear you have somebody who's rising in influence and becoming popular. So, of course, Find out what's wrong with her. Take her down. You know, the same thing happens with the, you know, we talked about this with One Night in Miami and Malcolm X. We talked about this with Judas and the Black Messiah. And now that uh, African-Americans are getting the opportunity to tell these stories and tell the truth about these stories. Finally. It's, it's such a huge, it's, 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 a, I feel almost ashamed at how surprised I am. Well, I've had a history with Miss Billy and one of the, the first records that I really took seriously and I was only maybe 18 or 19 was Lady in Satin. So a lot of this kind of era was what I was always obsessed with, especially with her. You know, I read books about her. I knew that there was, you know, the drug problem. I knew all of that. I was waiting to see how that was going to kind of play out in this. They actually were very tender with it and I can appreciate that. Um, I mean, it was it was a serious, serious business. But she, this Andra, this uh, can I cuss on here? Yeah, Go fucking ahead. amazing, just, just <laughs> fucking amazing, and everything that came out of her mouth. And you know, she's doing all of the all of the voice. She's she's doing all of this herself. And I only knew her from that Rise Up song, which I, you know, it was in every commercial, every video, everybody had it. But she's so much, she's a, a thousand percent more than than that song. That song's pretty beautiful. But what I liked about this was it, they made her human. I automatically went back to like um, Lady Sings the Blues, even Mahogany. I was going back to like that kind of thing. This was such a portrayal. And again, we, we live in a time now, thank God, where we can really, really show that grit. We got that grit with her. To me, seeing her in, in one of the situations that just, there's, there's a scene in this movie where, you know, she had her tour bus, her tour bus broke down and they're all outside playing ball. And this this guy that she'd been in, you know, in a relationship with, he comes to get her and she leaves behind somebody so very important to her and leaves behind the prez. And, and I, I know a lot of these stories, but I didn't realize how much, I guess, Jimmy played a part in this story. And 
that goes even deeper. They, they just, they just knocked it out of the park for me. I, I bawled pretty much, I don't know, that last 40 minutes of the movie, I think I just kept crying because I love her music so much and because I laud her as one of the greatest. And Strange Fruit is, if you haven't heard it, you have to listen to it because a lot of time when you're young and you hear those records around that time, you just think, God, this is great, but you don't pay attention to the lyrics. That was the one song that you have to pay attention to the lyrics to. Very yeah, I mean, I I can't really add anything to what you guys are saying other than, I mean, I guess I can, uh, other things I noticed within it are, I mean, part of the problem with, you know, stuff that goes on today in terms of like the police and whatnot and African-Americans is she was literally fouled all the time just waiting for her to make a misstep. That's something that we don't have to ever deal with. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the war on drugs, you know, I, I even early on, was, there's part of me in my head goes, well, she did have a problem, you know, because yeah. that's how we were grown up and were raised on. But uh, you saw why. Right. And yeah. that's the but that's part of there's so much unintentional racism. There. There's definitely intentional as well. But for a lot of people, they don't even realize it's racism because that's what's that war on drugs has been beating them so hard that rather than saying this person has a problem, this person's evil and yeah. they're not realize they're not really necessarily putting a color with it. A lot of people, too many are, but the way it all started was because of that. And I don't know. It, it, it just, it really did a good job of ham- hammering home how strong that war on drugs is and how many people really buy into it. Uh, and I mean, you can't look at stuff that's happened or you have to look at other things like George Floyd or whatever. For the most part, right off the bat, everybody who watched that video was like, yeah, that's not good. Even right wing people were looking at it and going, yeah, that's not right. But then as soon as the stuff came out about his past, like like that matters. That's they go. Oh, yeah. Well, well he was on drugs. That shit. Yeah. And it, it's that kind of. I mean, they don't realize people just need help. Uh, and but, you know what? The thing about this too is that right out of the gate, right out of the gate, that you know that very first scene. I keep calling him Leslie Jordan. That's that's <laughs> is that because I know him from Will and Grace. Right. I don't know um, what his actual name is. And I I do adore him, but it, when I saw him, I thought, Ugh, I, I felt a little bit like, oh, this might be a little miscast, but. He did a great job when he was saying, you know, it's like, couldn't you just not do that? You know, why'd you do that? You know, you could just do this. You know, why do you do this? And then the minute she comes out and says, have you ever seen a lynching? And to me, it was like, boom. And that reaction from Leslie Jordan, um, that was that that like kind of thing that he does shut down. And that's where we get to see this movie just that worried me. That very first scene really scared me. It worried the hell out of me. I'm like, oh, you could have gotten any bloody uh, Martin Short as Jiminy Glick would have been better. Why are you doing this? <laughs> but it it actually it, it turned out to be a beautiful, beautiful job that they did just starting it right out of the gate. And I'm glad that they kept going back to that because that's the era that I really focused on with her as well. It was it was that period of time. But I I can't say enough about this movie, not just as a fan, but because they took such great care in how they cast it. And I liked that we, we saw that, that it it wasn't a dark underbelly of jazz. This was just their life. And, and, and it's, it's how it was, it's how it was. And I could just really appreciate that. I really I don't think that I'm so glad to see that Andra won something for this because bitch is going to do some really great things after this. I just know it. Yeah. Throw every Uh, award at her. She disappears uh, into the role. Uh, You know, similar to, I mean, even better than like Joaquin Phoenix is, I mean, I, 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 when I watch walk the line, I I see Joaquin Phoenix trying to be Johnny cash. I didn't see anything with Billy holiday here. And that's hard to do in these biopics. Agreed. 
going back to what you were saying before, Bob, about uh, her being followed everywhere. I've been I've had this long running conversation with a couple of different people I know trying to explain privilege to them. They, <laughs> they cannot seem to understand that it is a privilege to not be followed everywhere that you go to not be considered suspicious just by walking into a place. That is privilege. We have the three of us each enjoyed Absolutely. that privilege. Uh, whether we knew it or not, and whether we've, right. we've constantly failed to recognize it, but it is a privilege that we have that uh, she was never, she was robbed of. She was, it was taken from her in a very specific uh, way. Constantly. Um, and, uh, that's, this movie is really great at demonstrating that. It is really great at demonstrating privilege. It's also a, a, a beautiful movie, and it's a movie that allows her to be uh, sexy and vulnerable as well. Uh, the, the the sex scene between her and Trevante Rhodes is makes me sweat just thinking about it. Intense. It's so, so beautiful. <laughs> beautifully shot. Uh, just lovingly beautifully shot. It's incredible. <laughs> and uh, again, you don't expect that in a, in a biopic like this, that type of uh, bold sexuality, and especially you don't get to see that among African American characters allowed to have that type of bold sexuality. You know what? I, I, what? What? You know, you're talking about with that. You know, as far as far as black characters, and again, we're three white people talking about this, <laughs> and and it seems it, it it it's awkward. But I actually, you know, that scene reminded me of Boys in the Hood between. Cuba Gooding Jr. and I uh, was it Nia Long that did that was was that Nia yeah, Long? Yeah, could been. Um, after you know, after this this horrific gang violence, he goes back to her house, and they're teenagers, and he just leans down, he gets down on his knees, and he just hugs her, and it turns into their very first sexual experience, and it was gorgeous. It was beautifully shot. The music was fantastic, and that's kind of what you know. Again, it's like you're, it's coming from a white person. You don't get to see these kinds of things. We've seen so many. We'll get to that with the doors. Too many, too many of these white bodies just doing things. Um, yeah. But it, 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 everything was beautiful. Everything was lyrical. Everything mattered. It all made sense. I, this movie, I, I don't know if I can watch it again because it was painful. You know, you, you know. Yeah, you get to that final that that final image of her. She's oh, dead yeah. and chained to her bed, handcuffed the, by the, the foot. Just yeah. the cruelty and and the the disgust. I don't I don't even know how anybody can be that inhuman. Yeah. I guess my question is: uh, Do enough of us have Hulu? Is this on the right platform? <laughs> Good right. Question. I mean, I, it's funny, but I mean that this is kind of a must-see movie, and it's on Hulu, and that kind of bums me out. This would be way way better off on even HBO Max, uh, Netflix. This really should have had this movie uh, or Amazon, but I just I people need to see it. So if you don't have Hulu, it's worth getting it for a month just to see this movie. It's that important. Get a free trial, my God! Yeah, I mean, it's it, this. This should have been. This would be like that theatrical film that I would have gone to. So, she can't get an Oscar from this because oh, yeah. it's on the I mean, she, the, No, they've changed all the rules this year, Thank so God. she'll she'll be eligible. And Thank I, God. Yeah, this is. Yeah. It, yeah. It's going to be up there at the end of the year for sure, in terms of best of the year. But That's how do you de- how do you decide though between her and Frances McDormand and Carrie Mulligan? Like, how do you decide? So they're in the I same the year. Too. I gotta see those. They the, <laughs> do they count as the same year? I I think so. Yeah, Aww. I think they're all. Yeah. I mean, I'd give it to her or Frances McDormand. So like I said, I mean, she was she won the Golden Globe last night. Andrew well, Day, I know. Oh, so did? they're all in the same. They're all in the same Oscar run. Okay, but by your rules, as far as Golden Globes go, we all know. If you win a Golden Globe, it's likely you're going to get that Oscar. Well, did I she mean, won it for comedy musical, though, or did she win it for drama? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I could see them throwing this in the musical category. And then, <sighs> did she beat Frances McDormand, or did Frances McDormand win too? I don't. I off the top. I don't know honestly. I think. I think she won. I think there was only one actress category, and there's one. I think there's only one actor category in the Golden Globes. 
there's a movie, two movie categories. There's musical movie, and then well, there's no, musical, I know and Jim, then there's drama. Jim, Jim Carrey has been nominated for the actor in the comedy one when it's he's been in dramas, and they've always made yeah. jokes about it. So I know there's they have the two categories. Whether they still do or not, they definitely used to. Oh, they always put comedians in the wrong category when they're in dramas. <laughs> Regardless, wars are stupid, but uh, all <laughs> yeah, three of them are the fantastic. <laughs> Well, really, any of them anymore. The Oscars have been disappointing for a long time. Not the Critics' Choice Awards. Yeah. No, those matter because Sean's name was on them before. <laughs> I vote for him every year. I'm a member. I know. You can vote for Star Wars before seeing Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't vote for Star You Wars. didn't, but other critics have. <laughs> uh I just hate Star Wars. Sorry. Uh, anything else on the United States versus Billy Holiday before we move just on? Just fucking watch it. Just yeah. watch it. Chavante uh, Rhodes from Moonlight. Let's. We for, almost forgot to mention him, but he's amazing. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event for the linear, legitimate, and universally recognized, undisputed <laughs> classic. Coal miner's daughter. Coal Miner's Daughter is a 1980 biopic of Loretta Lynn starring uh, Sissy Spacek and Tommy Lee Jones. And it tells the story of the woman who would go on to be the queen of country music, Loretta Lynn, who uh, had four kids at home when she went out and tried to become a country music star. And she yep. made it. And uh, I don't know why they decided to make a movie about her. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry. What's the, what's the big drama of this movie? She has a very happy life, and her husband might have cheated on her a couple of times, maybe. Uh, he, he actually really <laughs> did. Uh, right. But do you see that in the movie, other than him laying on a girl's lap? <laughs> uh, no. I, th- I think that there was some... Uh, well, obviously, I mean, we're talking about a movie that came out in 1980. Yeah. Um, you know... We're not going to get the grit that we will probably get in about 20 years when they decide to make this movie again. Um, <laughs> or maybe even five. God, we don't even they're know. Waiting for, they're waiting for her to die before they There, get- there it is. There it is. <laughs> and that- I'm, I'm sorry. Just every dramatic beat of this movie, everything that should be important doesn't feel important. Like suddenly you look up, she's got two kids. Suddenly you look up, she's playing the Grand Ole Opry. Like, I thought this was going to be dramatic. The most dramatic thing that happens doesn't even happen to her. It happens to it happens to Beverly D'Angelo. <laughs> she's the one who has something big and dramatic happen to her, and she's dead. <laughs> okay, but the thing is, like, you know, with Loretta, she she had a breakdown. You know, yeah. she, had a, 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 she was exhausted. And she realized, wow, you know, and, and by that point, I think... She had the twins, too. So she had six kids at home. She'd come from a holler. She came from nothing. Uh-huh. And then she she got to something. I mean, to me, that's... And the music was fantastic. The fact that Sissy and Beverly D'Angelo sang their own songs, that's impressive. I guess it's it, it, there's a certain unfairness from my part because I hate country music. <laughs> so there's that aspect of it. Not, I don't hate Loretta Lynn. I don't have a problem with Loretta Lynn. This I is... just don't like country music. I don't like the twang and all that stuff. And I, and so the, the musical aspects of this didn't do anything for me. I didn't care about it. And uh, even I thought the movie's called Coal Miner's Daughter, and there's nothing about the why it was important for her to write that song. On top of which... Her Wikipedia page is more dramatic than this movie. Did you know that some of her songs were banned from the radio because they were so controversial? Does yes. That come up in this the X. Movie? Does this movie come up? Does that come up in this fucking movie one time? The most oh. dramatic thing that happened to her entire career, other than her best friend dying, doesn't come up in the fucking movie. <laughs> I know. Again, it was 1980, and they still didn't like the fact that she sang a song about the pill. And, you know, after she had, you know, four kids by that point. Yeah, and Uh, is that in the movie? No. No. (laughs) Stop, it feels like you're slapping me through the camera. (laughs) Look, Sissy Spacek is fine in the movie, but nothing happens here. She goes from being happy to being happier and more successful. What a fun movie! <laughs> they, but they, and they didn't even really establish like the whole exhaustion thing. Like they should, right. they showed her with the pills. But yeah, I get that. But Bob, what was your take? 
with all of these movies, all these biopics, with the exception of the, the Billy Holiday one, really, uh, they they run through their career so fast. You know, whether it's Ray or Walk the Line or even the Motley Crue one, they just. <laughs> It's all about the performance. And its performance is great, which it is here. She disappears into the role. I look at that picture, and I don't see Sissy Spacek at all. All right. Uh, so she does a good job disappearing. Tommy Lee Jones does not. Uh, he's definitely Tommy Lee Jones the whole time. But, <laughs> With blonde eyebrows. Right. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. That drove me nuts. But they just, they're trying to cover too much in a short, in, you know, two hours. And it just never works right. And basically it comes down to do you like the performance or not? And, it, and most of the time we do. And we always nominate, you know, Joaquin Phoenix and Jamie Foxx. And did Sissy Spacek win for this one or get nominated? I I did. Yeah. 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 So uh, to me, that's what it's all about is just the performance of playing somebody that's real. But the movie itself is just kind of it's watchable, but it's so fast paced and you, you gloss over important things that. You know, just out of nowhere, you know, she barely knows Patsy Cline in this movie because <laughs> she dies so what? quick. Because uh, they, they have to they have to keep moving because you know she had a long career. You know, that's the problem with these movies. But uh, the, the, one of the, this suffers from that uh, that Stephen Hawking movie disease, where you don't make a movie while somebody's still alive. If they can still <laughs> tell you about their life, don't make a movie about them. Now, granted, okay. Rocket, Rocket Man is a different bit because El, I thought different. Elton John did a pretty great job with with uh, making that more of a dreamlike thing, not necessarily a biopic per right. se. Uh, but you're making this movie while Loretta Lynn's still alive. Is she really telling them all the truly dramatic things that happened to her? Or does she ask them to, to shave off the edges a little bit? And probably I'm guessing that she did because this I, movie has no edges. There, it's a completely smooth from beginning to end. Whereas if you went back and you watched Sweet Dreams, the Patsy Klein story with Jessica Lange, it's that's dark. And that, that that has a lot of grit to it. And I mean, you see the fight. What, what I didn't like about this movie was how they glossed over you know, like she could tell, you know, we all knew that Patsy did not have a great relationship with Charlie at all. It, they, it was bad. But not the, you know, even just having like a conversation about that, that didn't happen. Right. And that, yeah, that that was a bit much. But I mean, again, it's it's, it's from her point of view. No, I don't want to hate this movie. <laughs> you guys. I, mean, I don't hate any of them. I just like even straight out of Compton. Uh, it's a long movie, but it's just so fast. So much happens, and quite frankly, they shaved off the edges in that movie. Not all of them, but some of them. That one's hard, too, because we lived through that period right. of time. And remembering you know, how great some of those albums were, yeah, that that slightly disappointing. But again, how much can they fit into an hour and a half? Right. and that's Whereas this, they could have fit in more. But it's still watchable, and the performance is good, so it, yeah. it's got that it's, going for it. It's a bar- barely a TV movie, as far as I'm concerned. Do no, you're right. It's like, <laughs> I keep going around the house going do. do. <laughs> um, you're right. It, this this could have been a movie of the week. Now that I look back, but uh, you know, production wise, I, I I I thought it was good. I thought the soundtrack, again, I thought that was fantastic. I like any artist, any actor that's going to take on the role and then sing with it. That's, again, it goes back to Andra. You're actually singing that. You're you're mimicking that sound. That does deserve an, uh, an award, n- not just for mimicking, but because you, you just embodied the role. So like Bob said, you're right. I look at this picture. I look at Loretta. I don't see Sissy. And that does make a difference. On Maybe that, that's oh, why I like it so much. On that note, yeah. th- this guy saying this. Well. I do get another beer. <laughs> <laughs> because I took I took notes for this one, so I'll be back. <laughs> uh yes, from 1991. 30 years of the doors. Uh, Oliver Stone's uh, version of the lives of the uh, doors in uh, the 1960s and uh uh, this tells the story of uh, Jim Morrison, is played by Val Kilmer alongside uh, Ray Manzarek, John Densmore, and uh, the other one whose name I can't remember now. Robbie, Robbie, Robbie Krieger. Krieger. Thank you. Uh, I figured it out. Uh, <laughs> the uh, It's not about the Doors. It's about Jim Morrison because everything <laughs> was always about Jim Morrison. That's how, this, that's how the Doors operated. And it wasn't necessarily that he wanted it that way, maybe, but 
that's the way it became. Uh, and this is a lot of this is a lot of hippie bullshit. <laughs> this is just a really I love the doors. I love the music. I'm a big <laughs> fan. This one I would buy the soundtrack for. The rest of this the rest of this shit is a lot of hippie bullshit. And Why buy the soundtrack when you can buy the all you have all the albums? Fuck that. <laughs> it's a, it's a really great soundtrack, and there's some really great concert footage in this that uh, is recreated extraordinarily well. Val Kilmer really throws himself into it, and I just don't fucking care. I really don't. I don't care. I, I didn't buy into Meg Ryan in her role. Uh, I kind of bought in on Kyle McLaughlin as, as Ray Manzarek, who I think is probably the most talented person in the, in the entirety <laughs> of the of the whole thing. I think Ray Manzarek is way more important <laughs> than anybody in this movie, but he's not the subject. Uh, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with Morrison, per se. I don't have a problem with, John, with uh, Jim Morrison. Uh, I, it's sad what happened to him. It's sad that he burned out so quickly. Uh, but I, I don't... He was 27. Is there much to say about him? Uh, he, you know, he fit, he fit the mold of what he was doing very, very well. But I was having this conversation with somebody earlier about, about uh, what makes Jim Morrison, you know, so, so intriguing. And I, and I just thought to myself, you know, what if you had to be around Jim Morrison sober? Could you imagine trying to deal with this motherfucker while you're sober? <laughs> He's climbing on fucking cars, talking about being the fucking lizard king. And you're just like, Jim, get the fuck down. Please. I don't want to, I don't want to go to jail. We're going to Starbucks. Jim, come on. Like, That's today. He's talking about ride the snake. Like, <laughs> But back then, they the problem was they put him on a pedestal and treated him like a god. Yeah. So they, it was a cult. Yeah. I, I have – you guys know who Burton Cummings is? He's the Sounds singer from the, from the Guess Who. Okay. Uh, on my last podcast – not my last, but an old podcast I had, I got to interview him. And he was telling me a story about when he – when he first got to L.A. for the first time uh, – they would just gotten signed. They were starting to, I think these eyes was, were out. That song was out and the rest of the band wanted to go to the hotel and just go to bed. And he decided to just walk around. He ended up getting in a cab and the cab driver goes, Hey, are you going to the party? And he's like, yeah, I'm going to the party. This is a cab driver. Just took him to this house and he doesn't know anybody at the house. He sits down at the piano and he's goofing around and all of a sudden turns around and Jim Morrison standing at the edge of the piano. And he ends up driving Jim Morrison. Jim Morrison makes him get in the car and, drives him around uh, San, uh, L.A. for like yeah. three hours. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> uh, and so, a better story than this one. Oh, yeah. It was <laughs> this one. And what this does, it, it, what's crazy is everything I complained about in the last one, they yeah. take care of that in this. It's more original than those movies, but it's just kind of like, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if I it's thought- just uh, like – the like Jim Morrison's great and all, but he's also the most overrated talent of all time by a lot. Yeah. And uh, I think almost famous call him a drunken buffoon is pretty right on. And I or don't know. The if, guess who had the courage to be drunk, which is, I, I forget, yeah, <laughs> guess who, yeah. but that's where it's just kind of, I don't know. The further I get away from the doors is I like their music. It's very cinematic, but then when you watch yeah. the movie, you just kind of like, you're in it for a second, and then you're like, oh, this is dumb. <laughs> I have, has I have no to end. say this. My favorite line in this movie, and I yes, I did find one, and it was after Morrison was recording his uh, spoken word, his poetry, and he's done, and Val Kilmer, as Jim Morrison, stands up and says, come on, let's get some tacos. <laughs> That was my favorite line in this movie, but I have to I have to go back to this because I was reading what Siskel said. Yeah. And again, it just I found this really interesting because what he referenced is a movie that I do love. And he said in portraying of he he actually was talking to Oliver Stone and Oliver Stone said in portraying this life, he wanted this movie to be like all that jazz. He wanted Morrison to be like Bob Fosse. He wanted to portray it like all that jazz. All that jazz, you just, I, I don't know if you guys covered this on this channel, but it's a it, it's it's an insane movie. You have to be in the mood for it, but it was done so well, in my opinion. And I w- once I knew that, like I was reading that right in the middle of watching this movie, and I'm like, fuck this. Val Kilmer is no fucking Roy Scheider. Get out of here. Get out of here. 
You don't do that. This is not all that jazz. This is pretentious crap. And I thought Oliver Stone was like the pinnacle. And he was when he was doing this interview with Siskel, and this was like a very long interview. He was making JFK, or he was, they were getting ready to. They were in pre-production for JFK. So you could just tell Oliver Stone just kind of knew, well, I can pretty much do whatever I want at this point. People are going to take me seriously. This is going to be the most important film. All I saw was was women's bushes. I heard a lot of the same, uh, you know, I can appreciate the Doors music. I, yeah. I have never cared. And one of the other lines that I thought was really interesting, this was from uh, one reviewer. They said this was like a long slog through a Doors song. Because Doors songs get so unbelievably boring to me, and when I when I heard when I read that, I'm like that because it just goes on and on. And then you have Meg Ryan, America's fucking sweetheart, in this movie. Right. And by that point, Sleep is in Seattle hadn't even come out, but it was it was getting there. She'd already done when Harry met Sally. I bought nothing about her and and Pamela Corson at all. It was a pretty face and a nice body to make that. I bought Kathleen Quinlan as Patricia Keneally so much more than I bought Meg Ryan. And I don't even like Kathleen Quinlan as an actress, but I bought her. I, I got that. I don't know. This movie was trash. It's just absolute garbage. <laughs> Oliver Stone is certainly somebody who who bought into his own myth, and by by extension, I think he got a lot of other people to buy into it. And uh, if it's if I have any critical goals, it's to expose the fact that he's not very good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, once I'm you kidding, start, I'm the, kidding. but you're not wrong. I mean, other than like Platoon, which was subject yes. material he knew. He was so like yep. there wasn't no in, there was no interpretation. He knew it. Right. He, he, he was, lived. He was it. there. Yeah, everything that he's had to interpret though. Uh, he because Platoon was like so close to first thing. He, one of the first things he did, he never had to a- answer to anybody again, and that's a problem. If he had somebody saying, yeah. "Well, let's let's back off a little bit," he, I don't know. It's his interpretations really are junk. There's good acting in them, but the <laughs> movies themselves are problem. I think Val Kilmer's good in this. Yeah, but, I, I would I would say that the, he, he's very he he certainly looks like Morrison. He has got the he's got the Morrison act from any video that you've ever seen down. Uh, that's certainly true. Um, <laughs> it's funny when you, I was listening to an interview with John Densmore talking about uh, talking about this and he, he's talking about how Oliver Stone approached them to make the movie. And he's like, well, you know, there's really not that dramatic, man. <laughs> you know, other than you know, Jim died young, but I mean, we did not really a lot happen. And uh, he, he was kind of rolling his eyes, talking about how you know Oliver Stone's got like naked women running up on the stage. He's like, if naked women ran on the stage, I think I would have remembered that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, actually, I remembered only wanting to see this because it was '91 because I had a, a minor crush on Frank Whaley. <laughs> and he was so miscast and misused in this movie as Krieger. It was just like, mm. I, I love him. They have like that one really great moment again up on stage. They both are kind of fucked up, but I just give me back to career opportunities with Frank Whaley. I don't, I don't want this. I don't want him in this. You know, the, you know what this kind of reminded me of too was a uh, in, in a very bad way was Bohemian Rhapsody, which you know takes the takes the great things about uh, Freddie Mercury and you know kind of and the, 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 the lets the band you know basically off the hook. You know those guys. Nothing to say that that that, that Krieger and Densmore and, and Manzarek were bad guys. Uh, not to say that the Queen guys are bad guys, but but the fact that you know we're in the middle of a party. Nah, we're gonna go home. We're calling it a night, Jim. And that is, that is, see, they repeat that scene verbatim in Bohemian Rhapsody where Brian May and they were like, you know, we've got to get up tomorrow, Freddie. We're gonna go home because we're not actually rock stars. <laughs> <laughs> and like Bohemian Rhapsody, it's the music that gets you that right. you think you like it the first time you watch yes, it. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. Uh, with this one, where it suffers as Apocalypse Now already exists. So you've <laughs> already had the music. So, uh, the better Doors movie. <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, every time I watch it, I like it less. 
And I yeah. liked it the first time I saw I, it. That's the that's the experience of Oliver Stone movies. They're, they're diminishing returns. <laughs> I can't wait till we have to go to Natural Born Killers because I haven't had a chance to w- watch that with this through that lens yet. Uh, I I can't to this day, but please invite me back for that one because <laughs> I've got stories on that one. All right, I watched this one. <laughs> I oh, good God! Oh. <laughs> you crazy bastard! I was the hell? I was at work. I just put my phone on. It was in the background. Uh, this is it's kind of like the last champion, only worse. <laughs> oh, only instead wow. of wrestling, it's bull riding. <laughs> Are you going to do eight mile after this? Because I'm I'm done. I'm I out. Tried uh. to make eight mile the classic, but Sean said not no. eight mile. No, 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 eight seconds. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> this is this was comic. You know, pretty funny for yeah. I mean, not on purpose. It's a comedy? I mean, oh. no, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> It's oh, just that's, that's Balthazar Getty. I had a huge crush on him. What? Isn't that him on the end there? I don't know. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Gary Busey. Look, I can look it. like I can look like River Phoenix. Treat shut me like up. River Phoenix. You shut up. Hey. Shut up. Balthazar Getty had great hair. <laughs> but this is a. It was kind of. It was easy to watch. Scott Glenn rarely had a shirt on, which was awkward. <laughs> uh. <laughs> You gotta get that Scott Glenn fan service in there. Oh, yeah, he. Uh, Scott Glenn's a thirst trap everywhere. Right off the bat, he gets impaled by a bull. Oh, and then he nice. breaks his father out of the nursing home, and Gary yeah. Busey tries to bring him back. <laughs> Gary, Gary to, Busey, wait, Gary Busey is the voice of reason. Gary Busey is his brother-in-law. <laughs> Gary Busey is his brother-in-law, but in order to. To save the house, he has to get back into bull riding to win. His dad does because that no, would be no. amazing. Scott Gunn does <laughs> to to win a hundred thousand uh, dollars. It's I don't know. I it was free on IMDb. That's why I watched it. What year was this, Bob? Was this ninety? Ninety one. Ninety one. These all came out the same weekend. Yeah, it was a very good year. Ninety one. Yeah. But Scott Glenn was not. Uh, I, I guess you know if my mom was alive, she would be like, "Oh, he's he's hot," just like everybody I, thinks Sam Elliott is. I don't get it. You say ninety one's a good year. You're just you're not watching the movies. Um, I watched. <laughs> we're we're watching. We're watching these fucking movies, and this this year fucking sucks so far. So far, we, it's great because the Sounds of the Land ha- came out already. But you haven't got <laughs> right. Well, yeah. Break, okay, though. fine. <laughs> but Point Break has not come up to you guys yet. No, not yet. Probably this summer. Uh, it, shipwreck you need me out. for that one. You're gonna need. The, oh God! Didn't watch. I think this I've one. seen this movie. I may I have. Probably at school. Gabriel Byrne. Yes, I did see this movie. Not recently. Yeah. Whatever uh, happened to Nils Gop? Who's Nils Gop? Well, he's the director. The director. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! I have no idea. Uh. So, Bob, what's coming up next week? <laughs> yeah, that is our show. Next week, we've got Coming to America 2. That's on Amazon. Yes. Uh, Raya and the Last Dragons on Disney+. Plus. Uh, there's a movie called Boss Level on Hulu starring Mel Gibson and Naomi Watts. We may or may not watch that. A movie called The Sentinel on Netflix. And then you, you mentioned Sophie Jones. I don't know what that is. But yeah. It's... In 1991, Closetland. The Hard Way, La Femme Nikita, and New Jack City came out. Oh, so that's a big ninety-one <laughs> week. Yeah. I love New Jack City. I will always love New Jack City. I'm sorry, that's one of the that you was just, fantastic. You just like berets. Be clear. I did. I like the berets, <laughs> but that soundtrack had the original "Color Me Bad," so I want to sex you up. It was dirtier than the one that they released to the radio a year later. So, to <laughs> me, aces. Yes. And I don't know what our classic is yet. Probably some from Eddie Murphy. We've kicked around the Beverly Hills Cop. Uh, we've kind of done it before. Not necessarily as a classic, but I have no problem watching any of those old movies again. <laughs> uh, but we'll let you know on that one. Uh, do you guys have time for Flick Chart? Sure. Amy, have you heard of Flick Chart? No, it sounds terrible. It is. Okay. Where is it at? That's my Facebook page. <laughs> There we go. Flick chart. All right. So airplane versus Miller's crossing. Choose oh. which movie you like more. I, I go first and then you can go. All right. Uh, Miller's crossing. 
<laughs> airplane. I'm going Miller's Crossing. I do like Airplane, though. I do, too, but it's Miller's Crossing. I'm not going to do Hey Arnold. Sorry. No. Uh, I, don't. I was already Hey Arnold. <laughs> Mission Impossible. Last Boy Scout. Sorry. Rogue Nation or Last Boy Scout? Rogue Nation. Going with <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, when he's running down the field and shoots his way into the end zone, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> Man of Steel out of sight. Out of sight. Yes. Yeah. Out of sight for sure. Agreed. Go Sin City. Sin City. Sin City. Sin City. Sin yeah. City. I love Go, though. Good's great. Shrek. Four weddings. Sorry. Or four weddings and a funeral. Um. Four Weddings. Are you kidding? It's a fantastic movie. Shrek's a pretty fantastic movie, too. Yeah, but if you watch it now, the jokes don't fucking hold up. They're terrifying. <laughs> I love They're Shrek. Mike Myers terrifying now. Uh, uh, I'm a big Shrek fan, so I'm going Shrek. You can go wherever you want, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Four Weddings. I used to have like a life-size Shrek doll that I slept with as an, as an adult. <laughs> Oh, no. Until my wife threw it in the fire camping one time. <laughs> snake Eyes, The Dark Knight. The Dark Knight. Oh, God, yes, The Dark Knight. Fuck Snake Eyes. Uh, Manchurian, <laughs> the Manchurian I Candidate. I can't with this Braveheart. one. I can't. Oh, um, uh, I don't know. I'm not, uh, can you Manchurian Candidate is not it's, very good, and I don't it's easily care about Frame. Me. <laughs> Fine. Just give it to Braveheart. Uh, the last of the Mohicans, the apartment. The apartment. Yes. Agreed. Captain America, the Winter Soldier, Superman <laughs> 4, the quest for a budget. <laughs> Winter Soldier all the way. <laughs> three, ami- Is that three Amigos. Oh, three no. Amigos, the day after tomorrow. Three Amigos. Yeah, I hate the day after tomorrow, so <laughs> three amigos. In Bruges, the usual suspects. In Bruges. I'm usual suspects, but I love that movie. I'm usual suspects, too, even though I'm probably not supposed to like it anymore. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Lara Croft, Tomb Raider. Are Anne. you kidding? Are you fucking kidding? <laughs> Bob, no. What? I can't, no. <laughs> Did you see Adam? Did you ever watch Adam? I don't know what Adam is. Okay, I watched it like a thousand times because I was so afraid of being stolen by somebody else <laughs> in a white van with no windows. I it's, can't with this. This is terrifying. It's, a, it's literally a movie about uh, about a boy who was kidnapped in Iowa like th- two hours from where we grew up. Oh. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And Just stars Daniel J. Trevante. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I love that name so much. <laughs> Just do Laura Croft because I can't do Adam. No, 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 no. It's All painful. Right. I've never seen either one, so. Neither. <laughs> you know what scared me that around that time was D. Uh-huh. Snyder. <laughs> My baby, what? D. D. Snyder. Snyder. My babysitter oh, would play <laughs> Twisted Sister videos and I would cry. <laughs> and my dad had to tell her to stop. <laughs> the Mist Demolition Man. This is hard. Demolition for me. Man. Demolition Man. I love The Mist, but I have a soft spot for Demolition Man. Man on the Moon and Bewitched. Yeah. Andy yeah. Mist. Man on the Moon is better than Bewitched. It is. Yes. Drive, Syriana. Drive. You know, I have not seen either, so you guys had to pick that. I agree. Rocky Four, Misery. Misery. Rocky Four. Yeah. I mean, I'm Bastards. a big rock. Misery really <laughs> didn't hold up like I wanted it, it to. Really? Yeah, I I'm with you. Back. Nobody's seen Elvis on tour. That's not even a movie. Plus, I hate Elvis. Yeah, but no one cares about Transformers. Yeah, but fuck uh, Elvis. Oh, yes. The Crow. The Crow. The Crow or Transformers. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, it's a podcast. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Only the four people watching on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Friday, Flesh and Blood. I don't know what flesh and blood is. I've not seen that one. I would always go Friday anyway, but that's just me. Friday or training day. <laughs> uh, gosh. You I, love training day, didn't you, Sean? I do. I like training day. Yeah. Uh, I, I pick training day. I go Friday, but that's just I, because that's my humor. I'd watch but Friday I haven't seen first. it since then, so I don't know. I think I'd watch Friday first. 
Uh, do you know this one, Sean? Summer with no, Monica. I've not seen Summer with Monica. Unfortunately, I want to though. Scream three or Coraline? Coraline, buy a lot. Scream three fucking sucks. Yes. Prehistoric, prehistoric women. I've not seen either of those movies. <laughs> nope. Wait, prehistoric woman. That was a mystery science theater. Uh, Uncle Buck on that one. Or 101 Dalmatians. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Bob. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> Yeah, Uncle Buck's fine. I, oh, I'm not a fan shit. of it anymore. But Rio Two or Dude, Where's My Car? Uh, uh, I which, like the which, ultimate. I don't. Which one inspires you more? Dude, Where's My Car? <laughs> it's got a better it title. Inspires you more? <laughs> it's got a better title. <laughs> okay. Uh, Contagion or Fever Pitch? These are two really good movies. These are two really good movies. I, I'm I'm saying that. Uh, I'm going to go Contagion. The British version of Fever Pitch is better, but um, yeah, go Contagion. I would do that one too. I agree. The lives of Others, Faring Loathing in Las Vegas. Uh, I'm not sure about The Lives of Others. I think I might have seen it, but I don't remember it. I don't know it either. Uh, Madagascar 2. <laughs> Fear and Molly. Fear and Molly may be up its own ass, but it's more entertaining than Madagascar 2. <laughs> the Hobbit, Alien 3. <laughs> Josh's little heart tearing in half. Oh. Uh, uh, fucking, I don't know. I'd rather watch Alien 3. I think it's shorter. <laughs> At least it has Fincher's name on it. Exactly. There you go. Miami Vice, Zack and Mary make a porno. Zach and Mary all the way. Absolutely. Agreed. The Manchurian Candidate, 1962. The Count of Monte Cristo. <laughs> Manchurian Candidate. Yes. <laughs> Resounding, yes. World War Z up in the air. Up, up in, in the, the air. air. Yeah. Gangs of New York, the getaway. Gangs of New York for me, but I'm kind of alone on that one. I haven't seen either, so. God damn, I got to find a quarter. Gangs <laughs> of New York. Just don't like that movie. Oh, oh, yes. For fuck's sake. Come on. <laughs> Last one, Sean. Billy Madison or Ben Hur? Oh, fuck. Uh, Which one would you the, rather watch? Because uh, uh, Billy Madison, because I'd be watching Ben Hur through next week. Fucking hate Ben Hur. <laughs> both of them, in my opinion, I just don't care. Fucking tire fire, both of them. <laughs> All right. All right. That's oh come show. on. Good night. No, that's we're it's over. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Talk to you later. <laughs> Good day, all. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Bye. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, bitches. <laughs>